once saved, always saved is the biblical truth. Once saved, always saved is the biblical truth. Once you're saved, you can never lose your salvation. And this is a core part of the gospel. It is not simply an optional doctrine, but the Bible is very clear that once saved, always saved is the reality. And that is to say that the moment you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are saved forever. We'll be exploring, you know, several passages today that support the biblical truth of once saved, always saved. And we may be exploring a few that um, that, that uh, false prophets such as Dan Corner love to use to attack this great truth. And um, the truth is that if you don't believe in once saved, always saved, you're not saved because you don't believe in salvation by faith alone. Those who reject once saved, always saved, always preach a false gospel of salvation. They always preach that you have to keep certain commandments to go to heaven. They always preach that if you commit certain sins or live a life of sin, you go to hell. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Now, let's go with me right now to the gospel of John chapter 6. The gospel of John chapter 6 is where Jesus is very clear. Okay, Jesus is very clear. Let's go to the gospel of John chapter 6, right? Verses, um, verses 37 to 40. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So a couple here, here are a couple of things we can learn here. So from what Jesus says, right? Jesus is very clear that if you trust on him, you come to him, he will never cast you. He will never reject you. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. This stands in stark contrast to a lot of false prophets, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, Dan Corner, and others who teach that if you commit certain sins, Jesus will reject you at the end. That is not true. A Christian will never be rejected by Jesus Christ. And because Jesus said here, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Jesus will never cast you out. And Jesus said in John is chapter 6, verse 39, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Jesus said here most importantly, I should lose nothing. All of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Okay? This is very important. If you're saved, you're not kept by your own power. You are kept by the power of God. You're kept by the power of Jesus. Jesus is the one who keeps you. Jesus says, all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. But should raise it up again at the last day. Jesus said, all of which he, all of which he, the father hath given me, I should lose nothing. That means that if you're saved, he will never lose you. Jesus will never lose you. Not only will you never lose your salvation, you will never lose your salvation. But the biggest truth is that Jesus will never lose you. This is the biggest truth. Jesus will never lose you. You won't lose your salvation. The most important thing is that Jesus will never lose you. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus is very clear that if you trust on him, you have everlasting life. Okay? We see here what one must do to be saved. You know, how do you know whether a person is saved or not? Does he place all his faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and not in other things? Does he trust in only Christ and not other things to get saved from hell? Does he trust in Christ only? Or does he trust in other stuff? Does he trust in water baptism, church attendance, keeping the commandments, living a good life, you know, being a good person? Okay, these things, you know, are things that religion teaches, okay? Catholics, such as Dan Corner, they teach that you have to live a good life, keep God's commandments in order to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. You must trust in Jesus Christ. We have another place, right? We have another place, right? In John chapter 10, right? This is another passage that's very important, right? Jesus is very, so in, let's go to start in verse one, okay? Where, this is where Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, and goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. For they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will 
flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. Right. So this is very important, though. If you're a saved person, you follow Jesus. Right. You know, you hear the voice. Right. And the Bible says that a stranger will they not follow, right? But will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. What does the stranger mean in this context? The Lord Jesus Christ means that a false religion, false prophets, right? False religions who explicitly teach a false gospel, who add other requirements to be saved, such as water baptism, keeping God's law, keeping the commandments, living a good life, and the possibility of losing salvation through breaking the commandments. Okay. These are false religions, right? A Christian will not. Stop believing. A Christian will not follow false religions. He will not follow Hinduism, Catholicism, Buddhism, you know, Mormonism, and other false religions. A Christian knows the voice of Jesus. A Bible, a saved person should know, uh, should agree that the Bible is God's word. There's one God. There's one perfect God. You know, his, and the begotten son of God is Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died for our sins, and rose again the third day. And by putting all his faith and trust in that, he is saved. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's how you know a person is safe, right? A person, who, a safe person will not follow, you know, for example, the Pope. A safe person will not follow Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, and other, you know, isms, right? But the, but the safe person will follow Jesus Christ, right? The Bible, and Jesus said in verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The Bible is where Jesus Christ gave his, his life for us, okay? We don't give our lives to Jesus. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus gave up his life for his sheep, the saved people, the law, the saved people to save them, right? So, and then verse 14 says, I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep and of and am known of mine. As the father knoweth me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love him because I laid out my life that I might take it again. So Jesus is very clear that you must trust in him, right? Jesus, you know, his sheep follow him, right? There's one shepherd, right? You know, the main reason because of all these denominations is because people sadly reject the true gospel. They believe in a false gospel of works based salvation, right? Very important, right? So now in verse 24 it says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered him, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Okay? How do you know that someone is, you know, not saved? They don't believe, right? Jesus said, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. And now he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Okay? So if you're a sheep, right? A sheep follows the Lord Jesus Christ, right? My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. A Christian should understand the word of God, right? Understand that the word, the Bible is God's word. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So the, Jesus is very clear that, you know, once you're saved, you you have eternal life, right? You don't have temporary life. You will never perish, right? Jesus said, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What well, this is most important. Jesus said, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Neither shall any man means no man. No man at all, okay? You must be able to take this literally. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. No man is able to pluck them his sheep out of his hand, okay? Jesus said, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Listen carefully. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. No man means no man. Not yourself, not other people, not the Pope, you know, not, you know, Kim Jong-un, not whoever else. It's no man means no man. That includes yourself. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I'm telling you here today, if you're trusting in Jesus, if you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation from hell, you are one of his sheep. And no man is able to pluck you out of, out of the father's hand. No man. No man means no man. It means that includes yourself. Okay? No man means no man. Okay? Literally means no man. When Jesus says no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand, he means no man. He doesn't mean no man except my sheep. No man means no man, okay? No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. You can never lose your salvation no matter what. Jesus is very clear that you, you, salvation can never be lost, okay? And um, Jesus says, I know them and they follow me, okay? So now this brings us, of course, to um, 
this brings us, of course, to um, two common passages that are cited by false prophets who teach a works-based salvation, right? You know, some people, some people, you know, uh, try to use verse six. It says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned, right? If a man abide not in me, right? So some people will use this verse to say, well, some you can you can lose your salvation if you don't do what Jesus says. But notice this. You have to read this in context of the of the chapter, right? Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Okay. Jesus is very clear that his sheep follow him, okay? You know, and that his sheep, he knows his sheep, right? And this talks about a person who is not saved at all, right? If a man abide not in me, right? So abide not in me means he you know doesn't follow you know Christ, but he doesn't believe on Christ, right? He follows a false religion, he follows a false teacher, you know, false religion. Yeah, the Bible is very clear that you know if a man abide not in me, if a man abide not in me, that doesn't mean that you know that doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. Christians cannot lose salvation. We've already seen before, right here very plainly that the sheep cannot be plucked out of the Father's hand. The sheep can never be plucked out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking about people who were never saved to begin with. Okay, if a man abide not me in me, that refers to an unsaved person. Okay, Jesus is very clear that my sheep hear my voice. So once again, a true Christian, a saved Christian, knows that there's one God. He's perfect. Okay, Jesus Christ is his begotten Son, who died on the cross, lived, who lived perfectly, but he died on the cross and rose again three days and three nights later. And by trusting all your faith and trust in him, you're saved forever. That's what. A saved person believes. And a saved person will agree that the Bible is God's word, is the perfect word of God, right? They won't be following, you know, they will not become, you know, Hindus. They will not follow Islam. They will not follow atheism. They will not, yeah, they have, can have moments of doubt, right? But they will never, you know, stop believing. A true Christian knows that he or she is saved no matter what, right? So this is talking about those who were never saved to begin with. And now, more importantly, we're going to explore another passage right now, which is often used by false prophets to teach that you can lose your salvation. Jesus says right here, though, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name do have done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work in equity. Now, some people say, well, if a Christian lives in sin, if a Christian breaks God's commandments, God will just reject it. That is not all what this verse teaches. It is true, though, Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, right? But notice this here. Jesus said, though, and then while well, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Okay, Jesus said, I never knew you. Okay, I never knew you. These four, these are four important words. I never knew you. The most, the four most frightening words you can hear from our Lord and Savior is, I never knew you. Okay. And you notice Jesus says here, I never knew you. What does that mean? Jesus is very clear that if you get rejected by him, if he rejects you on judgment day, if he throws you into hell, that means you were never saved to begin with. Okay? There's no such thing as an ex-Christian. There's no such thing as a person who was formerly saved but lost his salvation. Jesus is clear here. He says, I never knew you. He didn't say, I used to know you. Jesus said, I never knew you. Never, okay? Because let's remember what we read in our previous in the previous chapter, right? My sheep hear my voice, I and I know them. They follow me, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Notice right here, Jesus said, I know them. When he talks about his sheep, believers, Jesus says, I know them, okay? By contrast, Jesus says to the people here, these false Christians, I never knew you, Okay? That is to say, if you go to hell, if you go to hell, if you, Jesus condemns you to hell forever, if he throws you into hell forever, it means he never knew you. He means you were never saved. Okay? He doesn't say, I used to know you. Okay? I used to know you. So so what is it with these people? Are these just, you know, Christians who lived bad lives, who broke God's, who broke God's commandments? Not at all. These are people who never done the will of the Father, right? Now that we've ex done the will of the Father, now that we've explored, explored John chapter 6, right, we we hear, hear we very clearly, okay, here we see this, you know, in 30, verse 39, all, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, okay? If you're saved, Jesus will never lose you. He preserves you till the end, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, okay? This is the Father's will, okay? That everyone which sees the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
The Father's will is that simply you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, period, okay? This is the Father's will, okay? When Jesus, you know, talks about when these people right here, did they do the Father's will? Okay, these are people who, who were never saved, okay? They never did the Father's will. What does that mean? They never put their all their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They never believed on Christ. When we talk about believe on Christ, we don't mean simply believing in his existence. We mean you put all your faith and trust in him and him alone and not in your own good works, okay? And now, instead of trusting Christ, what do these people trust? They don't trust in Christ, do they? They trust in their own works. They, Lord, Lord, have we prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. These people are saying to the Lord, oh, Lord, we've done so many good works. We've done all these good deeds. Why aren't we saved? Okay? These people think they're going to be saved. Why? They think that they've done all these good deeds, you know, for the Lord, right? They, they think they've helped the poor. They've gone to church. They've done X, Y, and Z. See, they say, hey, I'm a good person. I've done so many good things, right? Why am I not saved? Jesus said to them, I never knew you, okay? Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why? It's because salvation is not based by good works. If you're trying to save your, if you place your faith and trust in something else, you know, Jesus will say unto you one day, I never knew you, okay? Notice he says here, I never knew you. He doesn't say I used to know you. He says, I never knew you. That means that if you go to hell, it means it's because you were never saved to begin with. It's because Jesus never knew you, okay? As we've seen in John chapter 6 and chapters 10, right? Jesus is very clear that he never knew them, okay? Why does it say ye that work iniquity? Well, here's the problem. The Bible says all of sin can show the glory of God, right? You know, the Bible says even our best works are as filthy rags, right? Why does Jesus say, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, right? Why does it call them ye that work iniquity? It's because if you're not saved, your sins are not washed away by the blood of Christ. We as Christians, Jesus washed us, washed, washed away our sins, right? In Isaiah chapter 64, right, verse 6, it says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The Bible's very clear that the Bible's very clear that, you know, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. All your good deeds are as filthy rags. That's how God sees them. And that's what Jesus that's what Jesus says to them, okay? Jesus said, I never knew you. Why? You must put all your faith and trust in what Jesus did for you. If you're insisting on trusting other things like church going, if you think, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good Christian, I'm such a good person, Jesus will say to you, I never knew you. Good luck trying that, okay? And so um, now I want to explore right now the book of Romans a little bit, right? Some common passages used in the book of Romans, right, to supposedly support work salvation, right? You know, some people say, you know, um, you know, uses of verses six through um, eight, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient conduits and well-doing seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life, will honor them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul man that doeth evil of the Jew, first and also the Gentile. So what is this talking about? So does this mean that, you know, oh, you know, you have, it's, some people, you know, like Dan Corner will use this to push work stuff. You say, oh, you know, you, you have to do good works and do good in order to attain eternal life. OK, and if you do bad, you know, you will you will go to hell. But he looks look under this. You know, this verse says, but under that are contentious that do not obey the truth. Now, what is the truth? What is the ultimate truth? What is the biggest truth of all? It's the gospel. It's not the Ten Commandments. The biggest truth of all is the gospel. Do not obey the truth. That means. That means they reject the gospel, okay? So now, as for them, you know, as the this verse says, teach that, you know, oh, you have to, you know, do good in order to get heaven. Well, that's technically true. Keep in mind, friends, all verses in the Bible that supposedly teach work salvation are all technically true, okay? Technically, I'll submit to you that you can go to heaven by doing good works, by keeping God's law, if you keep them perfectly. But can you say that you've keep, kept them perfectly? Not, not at all, because, you know, if you, if you go to, you know, the next chapter, you know, if you go to Romans chapter three, right, you have to understand Romans chapter two is a very commonly used chapter by work salvationists. But all you have to do is just go to Romans, go to the next chapter. OK, Romans chapter three. Right. The Bible says in Romans chapter three, verse 10, of course, the worst verse we always use is when we go so way and as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that do with good. No, not one. So that's what the Bible says. There's none that do with good. There I said it. Okay, there, oh, rather, God says it. There's none that do with good. No, not one. So, Mr. Corner, Mr. Dan Corner, okay, if you're watching this video, I'll submit to you that, yeah, technically, it's true that you can go to heaven by doing good works. But guess what? God is very clear that there's none that do with good, okay? Our righteousness has filthy ranks. 
And technically, you can go to heaven by doing good works. If you keep them, God's law perfectly, okay? So, um, so, so now, um, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, does this mean, what is the works, what is by the deeds of the law? That means keeping God's commandments, okay? That's by keeping God's commandments, like the Ten Commandments, okay? Unless you keep them perfectly, you can't go to heaven. Okay, now let's move on right now to some other passages, you know, to to defend, you know, the fact that we are indeed saved. We are that we are saved forever. There's no such thing as losing salvation. That salvation is indeed eternal. Once saved, always saved. The Bible says in Ephesians one verse twelve that we should be the, to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of our promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of His glory. Right? The Bible says if you're saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Right? And the Bible is very clear that also in in in, another, in, in ch chapter two, right Ephesians two it says, "But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together in Christ. By grace are we saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly place in Christ Jesus." Now, so Jesus, the Bible is very clear that if you are saved, but you trusted in Jesus Christ alone, God has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, is this true right now? No. But why does God say he made, right, in past tense, a sit together in heavenly place in Christ Jesus, right? This is obviously talking about an event that, this is obviously an event that would take place in the future, right? If you're watching this video right now, you are not yet in heaven, okay? You are right now on earth, right? Regardless of whether you're saved or you're not saved, you're on earth, right? But if you're saved person, right, the Bible says very clear that God, if you're saved, God made you, you know, and me and all of us, right, saved people sit together in heavenly place in Christ Jesus. So why does the Bible use past tense to talk about something that will happen in the future, right? This is clearly something that will only happen in the future, right? Why is that? Because God exists outside of time, okay? Why does God use, God uses, how do we know that salvation is eternal and can never be lost and that we already have a place in heaven for us? The Bible says God made, M-A-D-E, okay? Not makes, right? Not will make. God, it doesn't say God will make us sit together in heavenly place in Christ Jesus. It says made us, made, M-A-D-E, past tense, made us sit together in heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Why is that God, the Bible uses the past tense to describe a future event? God exists outside of time. The Bible is very clear that if you're saved, you have a place in heaven. You're guaranteed heaven, okay? You're guaranteed heaven. You're not, you know, salvation is not something that's awarded at the end. That's not unlike what the Roman Catholics and all their false religions preach that, oh, no one's saved until the very end. You don't know until the very end, okay? God is very clear that if you're trusting Jesus Christ, you're saved forever. And now the Bible, of course, says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that are not, not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of us, and man should boast. The Bible is very clear that we're not saved by doing good deeds, right? If we were saved by doing good deeds, such as keeping the commandments of God, you know, or whatever, we would be able to boast. We can say, hey, I worked my way into heaven. The Bible is very clear that not of works, lest any man should boast, right? Not of works, lest any man should boast, right? So... Now, um, let's now that now you know, let's take you know, let's just go back to the you know, Romans, right? You know, Roman Romans chapter eleven, right? You know, this is again a passage which is commonly used by you know people who you know to you know push work salvation, right? You know, you know, it says you know in verses twenty one and twenty two in Romans eleven, for if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severely, but towards the toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off. So now in this, some people say, well, if you don't continue living a good life, if you don't continue keeping God's commandments, if you you will just, you know, if you commit serious sins like suicide, God will just take away your salvation. That is not at all what this passage preaches, okay? If you read this context, right, you know, this is talking about, okay, the context is that, you know, talking about Israel versus the Gentiles, right? You know, the Paul's very clear that God has not, I say that hath God cast away his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israel, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. The Bible is very clear that God hath not cast away the Jews, right? God hath not cast away Israel, right? So this is debunking replacement theology, which she's that, oh, God has already rejected the Jews, right? This is something I've debunked in another video. You know, I don't have time to do it right now. But right here it says, you know, so here's the thing, though. This, if you read here, right? If you're reading here, right? You know, 
this passage has not is not in context is not even talking about personal salvation, right? Because right here it says, you know, you know, in, ver, in Romans chapter eleven verse six, and if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The Bible is very clear. We're not saved by works, right? The Bible is very clear. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by saved by keeping God's commandments, right? So the Bible is very clear that in this context, right, you know, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather their fall, salvation has come under the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches, the, the riches of Gentiles, how much more their fullness. The Bible is very clear that right here is talking about the fact that God has temporarily set aside the Jews, right? God has not rejected the Jews, right? God has not rejected the Jews, right? You know, God has not, re God has not rejected the Jews, right? So, but instead, you know, the reason, the context is that because the Jesus is the prophesied Messiah of the Jews, right? But because the Jews rejected him, right? God put a temporary pause on his prophetic program for Israel. We've discussed this in other videos, right? In the book of Daniel, chapter seven, chapters nine, right? All the prophecies regarding the Old Testament nation of Israel, right? They were made in the Old Testament, right? In the book of Daniel, right? However, because of their rejection of the Messiah, God put a temporary pause on his program right but this is not even talking about the, the context is not even talking about personal salvation it's talking about the fact that you know that because the jews rejected jesus christ god put a temporary pause on his prophetic program right but we see here that god never rejected them right god has not cast them off right god has not cast them off right you know so right in the context of saying and so all israel shall be saved as is written there shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, right? When I shall take away their sins. So the Bible is very clear that in context, this is talking about the fact that the Jews, because they rejected the Messiah, God put a temporary pause on his prophetic program for Israel. Okay, God put a temporary pause. But as we've seen in other videos, right, that I've made, God will go back to dealing with Israel one day. God made an everlasting covenant with them. Okay, God is not done with Israel. In context, this is not talking about, you know, personal salvation at all. And, you know, if anything, you know, verse six debunks, you know, work salvation. So that is not, you know, so for Mr. Corner, you know, Mr. Dan Corner, Mr. Darwin Fish and all these false prophets, don't be using this chapter to promote your, your trash because it doesn't work. Now we go back to Ephesians, right? If you want to go back to Ephesians, sorry, I kind of jumping around here. If you go to Ephesians, right? Right. Ephesians, right? If you go to the book of Ephesians, right? You know, again in verse 30 right you know the bible says in grieving on the holy spirit of god whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption right god again says we're sealed unto the day of redemption now oh i've you know we've gone through right you know first corinthians chapter six right in another video but let's just go through this again because this is also another common you know common you know teaching that you know it's common chapter that uh chapter that's commonly used by the false prophets to promote work salvation right and this, in verses 9 through 11, says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusive of self of mankind, nor thieves, nor coaches, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Right? So Dan Corner and all those false prophets like to use this passage to teach the concept of mortal sins. Right? Say, oh, if you commit one of these sins on this list, you go to hell. Okay. I submit that they are correct. Technically, it's true. Okay? Technically, it's true that if you commit these sins, you go to hell. Okay? You deserve to go to hell. OK, and technically it's true that, you know, if you're able to live perfectly by God's commandments, you go to heaven. You can go to heaven by keeping God's commandments, but OK, you have to keep them perfectly. And this passage, like all other passages, must be interpreted this way. OK, technically it's true. Technically, you can get saved by keeping God's law, God's commandments, but you must keep them perfectly. But in context, read this. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. And in context, this is what what's this talk about. Is this talking about, you know, oh, Christians, P, Christians will commit these sins? No. It says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous, that refers to the unsaved, okay? The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one, right? So none of us are righteous, right? So yes, that the Bible is very true. It's very true that, you know, the wages of sin is death, right? You know, all these sins do make you deserving of hell, right? Including covetousness, right? Not just, you know, you know, fornication, you know, idolatry, adultery, you know, and stuff like that, right? The Bible, it's all true, right? But the unrighteous, that refers to the unsaved, right? Those who've never trusted in Jesus Christ. The Bible, and in context, though, and such were some of you, right? Were some of you. Before a person gets saved, right? He is unrighteous, right? 
but the, but after you get saved, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This is the proper context, right? Once you're saved, you're, all your sins, past, present, and future are washed away. And we've seen in Ephesians chapter 2. God has made us sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Why? God has washed away all our sins, past, and future, present, and future, because God exists outside of time. And then if anything, if you read this passage, right, we can know as Christians that we will never be judged by our sins. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world and the world shall be judged by you? Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So the Bible is very clear that if you're saved, you will be judging the world. We won't be, you won't be, God won't judge us for our sins. If anything, we will be judging the world. And we, and we also get to judge the fallen angels. Isn't that great? Right. And uh, if you want to go to Galatians chapter five, you have some other, you know, passage which is frequently used by, you know, false prophets to promote a uh, workspace salvation. Well, here's it. Right. You know, that you know, again, you know, in verse 19 to 21, right, it says now the works of the flesh are manifest. What are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lavishness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, stripe, sedition, Pharisees, everything, murderers, drunkenness, revelings and such like of of which I tell you before, as I've told you. In time past that they wish to do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, this is a common passage used by false prophets like Dan Corner to preach work salvation. But again, I submit to you, it's true. Okay. If you commit one of these sins on the list, yeah, you deserve to go to hell. That's why Jesus died for us, right? And technically it's true. You can go to heaven by keeping all of God's law, should you keep God's law perfectly, okay? So, but uh, but this this also includes hatred. Wrath, strife. I mean, these are sins we're all guilty of, right? At one time or another, right? Technically, that's true. That we committed these sins makes you go, makes you go to hell. That's why we need to trust in Jesus Christ. But if anything, if you look here, it says, "Christ has become of no effect on you, whosoever are of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace." That's for people like Dan Corn, right? All these false prophets. If you think you can keep God's law, keep God's commands, and go to heaven, try your best. The Bible says that you're fallen from grace, right? God, Christ has become no effect to you. Just Jesus just died for nothing, right? And now that brings us finally to, you know, the passage we've been all waiting for, right? You know, James chapter two, right? And that a lot of people will say, you know, faith without works is dead, right? You know, right? But the reality is that, you know, they say, well, if you don't have works, you know, your faith is not, you're, you have a dead faith, I won't say, but that's false. The Bible is very clear right here. James here emphasizes, well, for whosoever shall keep the whole law yet, if at one point he's guilty of all. The Bible says if you commit one sin, okay, you're, you're guilty of all sins. That's what James teaches, right? God's standard is none other than perfection, right? Because what did Jesus teach? James is just emphasizing, reiterating what our Lord said, right? Jesus, James is reiterating, it's, here's what, what did Jesus say? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And now Matthew chapter 19, right? Jesus is very clear, right? You know, again, this is some, you know, verses 16 through 21, right? You know, you know. You know, Jesus is, you know, Jesus, now some people will say, well, hey, see, you got to keep the commandments, right? But look here, what does Jesus say? If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But Jesus is very clear that you have to be perfect in order to get to heaven. James, all James is doing in that chapter is reiterating what our Lord said. Are you perfect? No, that you can't get to heaven by your own good deeds, my friend. Now, so... Let's remember something, right? So what are some, you know, passages that are also used, right, to teach, you know, work salvation, right? Now, um, take Hebrews 3, verse 12 to 14, right? He Take ye, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and depart from the living God, but exhort one another daily while... It is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceiving moments of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ that we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast under the end, right? So now, how do we understand this passage, right? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast under the end, right? We can understand this through First John chapter 2, verses 8, 18, verses 18 and 19, right? It says, they went out from, they went out from us, but they were not of us. But for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might have been, they may be made manifest that they were not all of us. So the Bible is very clear that if, you know, you, you know, end up turning away from Christianity, turning away from Christ, you never were saved, right? So this doesn't mean that you have to, you know, make an effort to endure to the end in the faith in order to stay saved, right? As we'll explore later. But rather, if you're saved, you will continue into the end, right? And when Paul used the word brethren, he doesn't necessarily mean saved people, right? If you go to Romans chapter nine, right? If you go to Romans chapter nine, right here, you know, 
Paul says, for I, Romans chapter 9, verse 3, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, Lord of the flesh, were Israel, through whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants that are given the law and the service of God and the promises, right? So in this context, Paul calls, right, his fellow Israelites, his brethren, right? But are they saved? Clearly not, right? They still are trying, they are trying to justify themselves of the law, right? You know, so yeah, brethren doesn't necessarily mean saved people. In this, you know, in this, I mean, brethren just refers to, you know, people in the church in general, right? But that doesn't mean he's a saved person, right? You know, he, the, yeah, there can indeed be unsaved brethren, right? As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 9, right? Let's look at now another passage, right? In Hebrews chapter 6, right? For is it, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again over repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God, afresh, and put him to an open shame. So the Bible, so now some people say, well, this doesn't mean that you lose your salvation, right? Just because you were enlightened, you know what I mean, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, that, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, that doesn't mean that you're saved, right? This passage is clearly talking about those who heard the gospel. They dabbled in Christianity. They went to church for a while. They perhaps listened to sermons, you know, they were moved by it and, you know, they were tasted it, right? They felt moved by the gospel, right? You know, but at the end, they never trusted in Christ, right? The source people just never trusted in Christ, right? You know, the people who just reject, ultimately, these are people who just like, I mean, perhaps they went to church for a while. You know, I, this, this describes some of my family members. They went to church for a while. For a while, you know, they, you know, they had showed interest in God and Christ, but in the end, you know, they just, you know, stop, you know, right? They never, you know, showed any interest, you know, right? So now, if you write, write, if anything, the book of Hebrews strongly supports once saved, always saved, right? Now, <clears throat> now, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 14, and every priest stands daily ministering, offerings, oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take with sins. But this man, G Jesus Christ, right? after he had Akbar, offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies may be his footstool. For one offering he hath perfect, perfected forever them that are sanctified. So by one offering, you're perfected forever, right? This is what the Bible says, right? You're saved forever, right? We're sanctified once and for all. This is what the Bible teaches, right? Now, if you want to go to verses 26 through 31, right? For if we sin willfully after that we have received knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice of sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, if you're in indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. But so some people say, well, if you sin willfully, you lose your salvation. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've, as I just said about chapter six, Hebrews six, receiving the knowledge of the truth doesn't mean that you're saved. Okay. This talks about those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. How much sore punishment, suppose he, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trod, trod to honor for the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, which wherewith he was sanctified, and an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. This is clear talking about someone who rejects the gospel, who's heard the gospel, but has rejected it. And can, right? And of course, you know, yeah, he has no excuse, right? He's going to be going to hell, okay? This is, yeah, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. This is talking about someone who rejects the gospel, right? But if anything, if you read in context of the books of book of Hebrews, right, you will realize, though, that salvation is ultimately by faith alone right and salvation is ultimately looking unto jesus hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 it says looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of god so the bible is very clear that jesus is the author and finisher of our faith jesus is the one who carries us to the end right and there are a lot of people you know who say you know um in um it says in Matthew chapter, you know, 10, verse 22, it says, and ye shall be hated of all men for my sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But in this context, Jesus is talking about a physical salvation, right? If you manage to endure, you know, survive, you know, until the end, right? You know, you'll be physically saved, right? Because, you know, Jesus is warning his apostles about you know, the persecution, right? About persecution, right? You know, but this is talking about a physical salvation, right? Surviving persecution, right? But, but as we can see, though, God's ultimately the one who finishes our faith or who carries us to the end. We don't have to make an effort to endure to the end. Jesus carries us to the end. And the Bible is very clear that God chastens us, right? Chastens us, right? For a sin, right? God disciplines us, right? We're his sons, right? But here's the thing though. Will God ever condemn us? Will God ever reject us? No, Jesus said, I will never, he and I will no last cast out, right? A loving father would never reject his sons, right? No matter how badly his son sins, right? So now, um, First Peter chapter five, right? Again, once again, first Peter, sorry, I think we turned the wrong track. First Peter chapter 
one, right? First Peter chapter one, verse five, it said, you know, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The Bible says that if you're saved, you are kept by the power of God, which again reiterates what Hebrews 12, 2 says, that Jesus is the author, author and finisher of our faith, right? And we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, right? So now, how do we interpret 2 Peter chapter 2, right? 2 Peter chapter 2, right? Some people love to use 2 Peter chapter 2 say, oh, you could lose your salvation, right? So again, right? It says, for after they had, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the launch of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse than with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to not not to have known, not to have known the way of righteousness, than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So, uh, so some people say, well, uh, these are people who just knew who, you know, they're saved, but yeah, they ended up living and going into sin and then they lost salvation. But no, that's not the case, right? Remember, we are kept by the power of God through faith under salvation, right? Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, right? Jesus is the one who preserves us, who carries us to the end. We don't have to endure the end ourselves. Jesus carries us to the end. So how do we interpret this, right? In light of these two passages where right, we just looked at, this is talking about false prophets, right? Okay, denying the Lord that bought them, right? This is ultimately talking about those who were never were saved to begin with. Right? But escape the pollution of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So what does that mean? So how do we interpret this, right? How do we how do we explain this? This talks about false, these false prophets, there are people, right, who know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They heard it. They have a head knowledge of the gospel, right? But, and perhaps for a while they attended church, you know, they went through all the motions of being Christian, but ultimately because they were never saved, yeah, they stopped leaving, right? They just gave up, right? You know, the Bible is very clear that if you're saved, you're kept by the power of God through faith under salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Knowing that, how can we lose our salvation given that God is the one who finishes us and God is the one who preserves us? And how can we say that, oh, these are people who are formally saved? The Bible is very clear that, you know, the, they perhaps had a head, they have a head knowledge of the gospel. They perhaps went to church for a while, had a no head knowledge of it, but ultimately they were never saved, right? These are talking about false prophets who deny the Lord or who reject the gospel, right? And knowing that, how can we say that, you know, salvation is by work so we could lose our salvation? Now, this is the final verse, right? We're looking at today, right? And, you know, it's where Jesus said, but he shall, that shall, Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure the end, the same shall be saved, right? Again, some people say that you, you say to use this verse to teach you to lose salvation or that you have to do good works to get saved. But in context, right? This is talking about the tribulation, right? Verses 21 through 22. It's saying, like, except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved, but the, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, right? There shall no flesh be saved, but this is talking about the physical salvation from the tribulation. If you endure to the end, right? But so here says, the verse 13 says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Endure to the end of what? Clearly, if you read in context, this is talking about those who survive the tribulation, who physically endure to the end of tribulation, who will be physically saved by the second coming of Christ, right? This is talking about a physical salvation, not a salvation of the soul. Because after all, we just read, Jesus is the one who preserves us, right? We've read in John chapter 6, right? In verse 39, we've read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We read in First chapter 1, verse 5. God preserves us to the end, right? So how can you lose salvation? And I hope this video was a blessing unto you, right? And to help you realize that ultimately we're saved by faith alone and not our own efforts. And if you're saved, you trust in Jesus Christ, recognize that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, right? You've been sealed by him, right? And he's the one who's going to carry you to the end, right? And yes, there will be times where you'll fall and God will discipline you, right? God will discipline you. God will spank you, right? Like a father spanked his children. But will God throw you into hell? Realize this, friends. You are a child of God. You are God's child, right? You know, you are a child of God. The Bible, For our last verse of today's session, right? The Bible is very clear that, you know, as many as, John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received them, to hit them gave ye power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, not born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The Bible is very clear that you are a son of God, right? If you trust on him, you're a son of God, right? You're, you're, this is a supernatural spiritual birth that God generates, right? And since God generated this, how can man reverse this, right? God generated this birth, right? And God is the one who preserves you, right? God is the one who carries you all the way to the end, right? We can't carry ourselves. We are weak, right? So my friends, please.
understand that there are way too many false prophets in the world, right? I hope this video was a blessing. If you haven't trusted in Christ yet, please do. Your eternal destiny depends on it.